So my favorite YouTube channel for the past few months now has been Hours Poetica, which puts out a video a few times every week with somebody, often the actual poet, reading a poem. It's just so great, and it exposes me to a lot of new poems and poets I wouldn't otherwise know. And today I want to discuss why I enjoy it and poetry so much, and why I think that you can too. I like different types of poems for different reasons. It's kind of like food or music. To say you like food is it's just kind of a silly statement. Like, of course you do, but be more specific. And it would be the same if you said you liked poetry. There are a lot of different kinds of poetry, and they fit different occasions, moods, and purposes. Poetry is not one thing, and if every time you've gone into it thinking that it is, well then you might be doing it wrong. You may not be interested in some or even most poetry, just like you might not be into some or even most music but there will be a song or poem that you do like. In the book Don't Read Poetry, Stephanie Burt does a far better job than I can in characterizing the reasons that we might have for enjoying poetry. And so I'm just gonna shamelessly rip off her organization and break this video up into the six reasons you might have for enjoying poetry. It's a fantastic book and I highly recommend picking it up. With that attribution covered, let's get started. Not all poems are emotional. But some are. Poets professionally look for metaphors and language that apply to the human experience. A popular reason for enjoying poetry is that poems will give you the images and vocabulary that can help you process your emotions. They can give you the words to clarify the way that you feel. There are going to be times in your life when you are filled with an emotion that you are not ready to deal with. And that is going to be hard. It's part of being human. And in those moments, poetry can help. It's why poems like Good Bones by Maggie Smith go viral on the internet in times of national tragedy. That metaphor of a house that could be great if we just lived in it better helps us process what we're feeling. A W.H. Auden poem, which was originally embedded in an otherwise forgettable play, is about the death of a loved one, and it opens with the lines, Stop all the clocks. Cut off the telephone. Prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone. Silence the pianos, and with muffled drum, bring out the coffin, let the mourners come. That poem shows a private pain projected into a public space. Stop all the clocks, not some clocks, not just the clocks around me. Stop them all. That feeling that you hurt so much that you cannot believe the rest of the world is continuing on. Auden or some other poet can help you give the language to process that. Some stories you like for the plot. Other stories you like for the characters. This is also true in poetry. This is obviously true in some long poems, like the reason that you read the Odyssey is because Odysseus is a fascinating character. Horrible, but fascinating. But it's also true of shorter poetry as well. One of the most fun genres of poetry is the dramatic monologue because it puts you in the head of some interesting characters. Carol Ann Duffy is a master of this. She has a whole poetry collection called The World's Wife, where she writes poems from the perspective of women with famous husbands. There's Mrs. Freud and Anne Hathaway, Shakespeare's wife, but there's also Queen Kong and Lazy Lazarus. They're fun and moving, and the characters she gives voice to are a large part of why many people read them. Her poem Stealing, which is not from The World's Wife, but it's still a dramatic monologue, begins with the line, the most unusual thing I ever stole? A snowman. Midnight. He looked magnificent. I mean, tell me that's not an engaging character in the first two lines. I don't watch much gymnastics in my day-to-day -day life, but when the Olympics are on or Simone Biles is doing anything, I will stop what I'm doing and watch it, because anything accomplished with that much skill, technique, form, whatever you want to call it, is awesome. Watching masters of any craft performing that craft at the highest level is worthwhile and will instinctively draw your attention. And so you may not read poetry in your day-to-day -day lives, but when Shakespeare starts to write, That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves, or none, or few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare, ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang then you might want to stop what you're doing and listen for a few seconds. That's a master performing at the top of his game. Or when John Keats gets going and you hear the words, Darkling, I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death. 
called him sweet names in many a muted rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. <laughs> can you even imagine writing something that good? There are some things that you can do in poetry, like gymnastics, that are simply more difficult to do than other things. It may not be as clear cut as gymnastics, where adding a half turn obviously increases the difficulty of the total move, but I think that there are still some parallels. Like completing a sonnet, a 14 line poem in perfect iambic pentameter in strict rhyme scheme is just not that easy. So let's take those lines from Shakespeare's 73rd sonnet specifically and see if I can explain this. No promises. First, every line is 10 syllables long. They have a set rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, behold, cold, hang, sang. So that in itself is not easy. These lines are the first four lines of the sonnet. A quatrain is what that's called. They propose a metaphor for old age, late fall or winter. The speaker of the poem is clearly sad that he's getting old, but he doesn't say that directly. It's just in the sound context meaning of the words that he's using. The old age has him say, yellow leaves, or none, or few, like a confused old man. He then connects this metaphor of seasons to a metaphor of time on a larger scale, when the boughs of that tree shake like a trembling old person. He doesn't tell us that, we just know that it's like an old person. And those boughs shake against the ruins of a choir that lately had birds singing. So at one point, presumably, that choir had a human choir singing in it, but time has changed that, and the church evoked by this image is now a set of ruins that host birds instead of people. So seasons have a cycle of birth and death, and centuries also have a cycle of birth and death, demonstrated by those ruins. And of course the poet sees himself reflected in those cycles, and all of that is done in just four perfectly paced lines. So yeah. There is some poetry that you read just to see a master exercising the full force of his or her skill set, and you just have to marvel at the way that form, language, and meaning all come together with not a single syllable out of place, and just listen to them stick the landing. You may not get that feeling when you read Sonnet 73, and you might not in other places either, and that's okay. This is only one of the reasons that you could have to read poetry. If you never get that feeling, fine. So this might sound weird, but some people, myself included, like poetry when it's difficult. Like in the same way that some people like crossword puzzles or Sudoku puzzles, sometimes we just like to be challenged by something clever. Perhaps because there's a joy in giving something your full attention, struggling with it, and then figuring it out. Like I have always enjoyed the poetry of John Donne. John Donne is very clever and very difficult, but when you figure it out, it's, it's always rewarding. Some of his poems are fun, like his poem The Flea. Some of his poems are dark, like The Relic. But his poetry is always clever. The poems are like little philosophy or logic puzzles to sort out, and if I'm honest with myself about why I like them, I like them because they're hard. I like the game. I like matching wits with done to see if I can keep up. Most of the time I can't, but when I can it's awesome. Or like, take this E.E. E. Cummings poem, for example. You gotta figure that out. It's a puzzle, and there's something fun about solving a puzzle, particularly when the solution has a meaning and possibly some wisdom. Which brings me to... Not every poem has wisdom, but there are certainly some that do. I'd go so far as to say that any poem by Ross Gay or Elizabeth Bishop has wisdom. Wisdom is also something that is hard to define, but I think that you'll know it when you see it. Like, take the poem Bride, Wife, Widow by Mary Leader. I adore the way he hums when he shaves, his deep voice, his small lotioned hands. I detest the way he hums when he shaves, his deep voice, his small lotioned hands. I miss the way he hummed when he shaved or did any small thing with his hands. There's a lesson in there applicable to all sorts of situations, and I hope that you find the one for you. So some people might read poetry for the advice that it can give you about gratitude and paying attention to the smaller moments, which in fact might be the larger wisdom of reading poetry as an act at all. Just pay close attention to something and take it seriously. That's what poetry asks of us sometimes, and that has wisdom on its own. And finally, sometimes we like poetry because of the communities that it connects us with. This can take a lot of different kinds of forms and could probably be a video in itself. In fact, I, I think it, it kind of is. But quickly, spoken word poetry, for example, brings people together and allows a lot of people to tell their stories to a group. 
And you may not like the poetry in high school, but you might love being a participant or an audience member of a spoken word night. Or sometimes when a poem has a history and a fan base, there are people who form communities around those certain poems. I love Homer, for example, and those Madeline Miller fan fictions let me know that I'm not the only one. I love Chaucer, and so when Patience Agbaby remixed the Canterbury Tales for the 21st century, I read those poems for the community and the shared stories and the inside jokes. Yeah, okay, I like inside jokes about Chaucer. That's a thing I like. Or when a class reads poetry together. It will knock us off our usual scripts and ask us to collectively take a piece of writing as seriously as we can and treat every word as sacred and special. And that act, that practice, will connect you to the people that you do it with. So if for no other reason, you should read poetry for the community it builds and the connections that you will make. So I hope you go out and feel inspired to find a type of poem that you like. Thank you for watching.